Hello, everybody. Welcome to week seven. We're officially, I guess, about halfway through the semester, so we've actually uh, made it to the midterm, which is kind of crazy. Uh, speaking of which, we have our midterm exam coming up next week. Um, it will be similar to the quizzes. It's going to be multiple choice, true, false, but there are going to be short essay questions as well. Uh, when I say short essay, I mean like two to three paragraphs. And uh, another difference is that it's going to be a closed book. So uh, I will open up the, the midterm on, I think, 7 a.m. on Friday. It'll be open uh, until Saturday at midnight, and that's, that's next week. That's the weekend before spring break. Something else to say on that is that um, when you see your grades, uh, they, are, they aren't the actual final grades because in addition to the true-false multiple choice, I have to go in and uh, grade the, the short answer questions by hand. So, so that'll take a while. So if you see a grade on there that looks pretty low, uh, don't worry about it right away at least because uh, I'll have to go in and, uh, and, and grade some of it by hand. Uh, the material will cover it'll will cover all the material up through this week. So so next week's material on Lincoln uh, won't be on won't be on the midterm. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, any of the readings, um, you know, the videos, uh, any you know lectures I've had you guys listen to, all those things are fair game for uh, for questions on the midterm. So that's one announcement. The second announcement is just sort of a reminder that. In the discussions, when you're doing the discussions, um, it's not okay to copy some copy somebody else's discussion post and post that as your own, even if you change a few words here or there, right? So, you know, I know uh, a vast majority of you guys are are not doing that, uh, but if you are, you know, it's plagiarism, right? So, and plagiarism is serious, so uh, don't do that. And to make sure that you don't do it. One of the things that I'm going to do from now on is that when I post a discussion post, um, I'm going to set it up with an option where you actually have to write your post before you can read other people's posts. Um, so that will be going into effect uh, starting with tomorrow's discussion, which I'll post uh, tomorrow morning sometime. So don't, you know, don't do that. Okay, um, so last week we were kind of swinging right from to sort of the extremes of uh, of individualism and individual liberty in the United States. Now the interesting thing is that something that we have to remember is that the whole thing, you know, the whole thing that got the American project going, right, was this this notion of individual liberty, you know, the uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, right? So we have this notion of people have natural natural rights. So, you know, when I was asking the question about the distinction between, you know, the founding fathers and Thoreau and Emerson, uh, it's kind of tricky in a way, right? Because they all do, they all are proponents of, you know, individual liberties. Uh, the question is, um, how do you secure those individual liberties, right? So the things that Emerson and Thoreau were talking about it's arguable that the reason that they could actually talk about these things and you know publish these papers and give these speeches is because of the strong government that was set up uh, by the founding fathers, right? So they wouldn't have had the right to, or they at least they had they may have had the right, but they wouldn't have been able to actually go out and and enact um, those things that we we're talking about, right? So so it's 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 tricky. Right, so trying to draw the distinction just on the matter of individual liberties is is not enough. Right, it's it's a question of you know what's the justification of those individual liberties, and they all believed um, that that they were natural, that they were God given. Right, but they also had very different perspectives on human nature, <clears throat> which is a, it's another major difference between the between the different groups. Right, so uh, the Federalists and Madison said you know, famously said in um, in the Federalist Papers that if man were angels, no government would be necessary, right? So so right away they're talking about man as sort of, uh, you know, flawed, right? And man is something, somebody who actually needs a strong government to come in and sort of keep them, keep them in check, right? But, of course, uh, Emerson and Thoreau, um, seem to think that, you know, man is not inherently bad, right? And I mean, that's when, you know, um, 
Thoreau makes his famous statement, you know, that government is best which governs least. <clears throat> and he says eventually the government is best which governs not at all, right? And when men can sort of rise past, uh, you know, this need for government, right? So, so you have two very different perspectives on, uh, on human nature. The, the founders, and even Jefferson as well, because Jefferson was an advocate uh, to a much more limited degree for, for a strong government and state governments, right? He knew that there was a need uh, for some sort of artificial body to actually, um, you know, keep people in check, right? And, you know, Thoreau and Emerson were saying that, you know, rather than looking to this particular community or this particular body or institution to provide our rights, well, we have those rights. So let's exercise them, right? And let's let's transcend our, our nature, right? Which, of course, is, you know, American transcendentalism, you know, is largely derived from the works of Emerson and, and Thoreau. So that was a, um, you know, philosophical movement that arose. Now, Thoreau's was a little bit different uh, because he was responding to to some particular things, right? Thoreau was responding to slavery as an institution, which we're going to talk more about uh, this week. And we're going to see the sort of two types of defense this week for, for slavery. Um, one from... Um, John Calhoun, who was making sort of this federalist states' right states' rights argument for um, for slavery, and then you see this uh, you know George Fitzhugh character who's saying that it's actually you know of course it this crazy argument that it benefits the slave right the slave is better off to be enslaved. So so anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, I was talking about Thoreau, right? <clears throat> so Thoreau's responding to slavery. Right, and he's saying, you know, how can you claim to be just when you have such an unjust institution? Sort of going along the same lines of what what Frederick Douglass was was saying. Um, he was responding to that, and he was also responding to to the Mexican War, which uh, he also viewed as as unjust. Right. So this notion of civil disobedience, um, you know, it's it's something that we've seen. You know, Gandhi famously, right? Gandhi had read civil disobedience, Martin Luther King Jr. had read civil disobedience, so, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the figures that we look at as sort of social justice leaders actually derived, derived their ideas from, from this, uh, this essay, uh, from Thoreau, who, of course, you know, refused to pay his poll tax because he said, you know, I'm not going to, you know, pay, paying taxes is a type of complicity as a citizen, so, you know, while I'm not going to, you know, go sort of up in rebellion, um, you know, I'm not going to go along with it. Um, somebody in the discussion post made an interesting and, and a, a good observation that uh, essentially the founding fathers were doing the same things, right? Because they, but it wasn't civil disobedience in their case; it was you know, armed disobedience. It was a revolution. So perhaps you know they could they could uh, you know sympathize with Thoreau more on sort of the civil disobedience level, but they could disagree with him because and remember that. Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, in a lot of ways was making a legal argument, right? He was saying that under the laws, you know, the laws of Britain, <clears throat> these are the certain rights that we should have as citizens, and those rights are being taken away, right? So that's how they rebelled. Similarly, with the Constitution, right, uh, or the Declaration of Independence, Thoreau could point and say, okay, this is what you say in the Declaration of Independence, uh, but you're not living up to that, so therefore... I'm justified in my my disobedience, right? But you have to remember that the basis of that disobedience <clears throat> comes out of you know some sort of formative government, right? So it's it's kind of paradoxical in a way, and I said this in several of my posts. But um, individual liberty, in a lot of ways, is dependent upon the presence of a strong government. So, and this this goes sort of I don't want to go too far off track, but this goes all the way back to sort of Thomas Hobbes. Right, he was sort of the, sort of the the forefather of this idea of uh, natural rights and individual liberty. And Hobbes said that you know he said that all men do have sort of natural rights to everything, right? And <clears throat> with the absence of some sort of government, he called it the state of nature, right? So you have all these people out there, and everybody is entitled to everything, right? So of course, if you have a society or a situation where everybody is entitled to everything that's going to lead to great conflicts, <clears throat> right? And that's why Hobbes said that 
the state of nature is a state of war, right? And he said that life in the state of war is poor, nasty, brutish, and short, right? So we essentially, because we're entitled to everything, we end up killing each other off, right? So Hobbes' solution was that we needed some sort of mediator, <clears throat> right? So everybody, in a sense, would surrender their their entitlement to everything to some sort of other body that could keep all the people in check, right? So, and in Hobbes' case, it was surrendering your authority to a monarch, right? Leviathan is the book that that he wrote, that he was talking about, you know, doing this, and that's what he, the Leviathan was, the state, right? It's this body that individuals give all their power <clears throat> to, but they do that so that they can enjoy uh, prosperity and property and, and have the rights to things like freedom of speech and stuff like that. Um, so Locke comes along, right? <clears throat> and Locke sort of, some people call uh, Locke Hobbes and Drag, even, even though they, they seem to be a bit different. They, they're both very rooted in this idea of natural rights, right? So, and for Locke, it was, um, you know, the rights to life, liberty, and property. And uh, so anyway, uh, but once again, Locke thought that there needed to be a strong government put into place to protect individual property rights, right? Because that's what people would pursue to actually be happy, right? So there's this balancing act between having the rights that you're entitled to, right, and having some sort of body there to protect those rights to make sure that, you know, it's not dog-eat-dog -dog and we don't end up in the state of war. So, so yes, we do have these natural rights, uh, but without some sort of adjudicator or mediator, we eat each other alive. At least that's the, the argument that uh, Hobbes and Locke and that the founders would make, right? Now, uh, Emerson and Thoreau may not, may not go along with that, right? But the, the very reason that they could make those particular arguments was because that there was a government like that in place, right? And, I, you know, I think it would take sort of a fundamental shift in human consciousness, and that's perhaps what, um, perhaps what Thoreau was talking about in some of the cases when he says, when man is ready. Right? When man is ready, no government will be necessary. And we'll know that the individual is the true basis of, of legitimacy in, in society. Right? And, you know, Emerson's stuff about, you know, we can remove ourselves from society and, you know, we don't really need, you know, to rely on community or other people. Interesting in theory, right? But, you know, I would ask you, you know, how many times in your life have you been completely isolated? From somebody else or have not been reliant on somebody else if you ask yourself that question honestly we're born into the world reliant on other people right we i have a baby on the way and you know, the baby's not going to survive if myself and my wife are not there to take care of it that doesn't mean that that shouldn't work towards a type of self-reliance but to think that you know we can be completely self-reliant is a bit of a you know a bit of a stretch right so Anyway, it's interesting to see sort of, you know, this notion of individual liberty taken, taken to ex its extreme, which we see here. But we have to remember that those notions of individual liberty are couched within a society based on, you know, a type of government. So anyway, that's, uh, that's it for this week. Um, we're talking about slavery, and we're really sort of bubbling up to, you know, to the Civil War, right? Calhoun in his in his speech has some pretty, you know, contentious things to say that are sort of forecasting the future of the way that things are going to go with the Civil War, and you can sort of see how it shakes out, and then you can be kind of repulsed by uh, Fitzhugh's uh, sociology for the South, which, is, you know, I just included some, some, uh, some of the uh, headlines from that, right, because it's pretty long, but there's some pretty, pretty crazy stuff in there. So anyway, um, hope you guys have a good week. Um, if you have any questions about the midterm, let me know. Um, happy to happy to help you out with that. And uh, yeah, the discussion will be up tomorrow. And remember, and for this particular case, the discussion will be you'll have to at least for your first response, right? So for the response to my particular post, you'll have to write it before you see uh, see other students' responses. And then, of course, for the response after that, it will be open. So anyway, have a good week.